the victim of a terrible car crash in the United States miraculously returned to life. Members of a Russian family with congenital deformation of their fingers. A girl who came to a Russian province from Canada in pursuit of a childhood dream. What all of them have in common is the name of the legendary Soviet surgeon who presented the world with the revolutionary technique of knitting bones and an outstanding invention, the Ilizarov apparatus, or simply the Ilizarov in medical jargon. It's also popularly known as the frames. Kurgan is a small industrial township 2,000 kilometers from Moscow. There is a medical research center on its outskirts. You don't need to go inside to see the work of the researchers. All you need to do is enter the compound. Even dogs walking around the place have strange devices on their legs. Devices like this, the medical center and its celebrated founder have made Kurgan famous. Many patients usually get together at the center's winter gardens. The center itself is a medical hub attracting people from all over Russia and foreign countries. Oksana has made a long trip to reach it. She's a Canadian citizen. She emigrated to Canada from Belarus more than 10 years ago. She's been wearing several frames for three months, but one of them will be removed tomorrow. She's been waiting for 20 years. What prompted her to travel all the way from Toronto to Gagan was not an injury. Rather, it was a childhood dream. At 16, I already knew only too well that my legs were ugly. At the time, I went to school with a girl a year older than me. Her legs were so bandy, they almost looked like a wheel. At some point, she went away but returned a year later. And she had perfectly shapely legs. In 1952, Gavril Ilizarov, a Soviet surgeon unknown to anybody, presented a revolutionary device, an external fixator for bone fractures. His invention provided the best conditions for bone knitting, no bloodletting. The bone is supplied with blood almost as much as before, and the patient is allowed weight to bear on the injured limb. More importantly, in the course of the application of the device, Ilizarov made several scientific discoveries. He found out that bones were capable of speedy regeneration, and they also grew if strained, so that they could be lengthened as well as knitted together. Children account for around half of the center's patients. Congenital diseases are what the center's doctors in Kurgan are focused on. Today, on average, one baby in every 10,000 born in Russia has congenital anomalies, and their numbers are growing. Young patients spend their time in a room specially set aside for children. All of them are keen to pursue their favorite pastimes. The yellow one, Danila. The yellow one, please. Three-year-old Danila likes this game most of all. He enjoys building pyramids of different colors because his mom likes them so much. But he hates people wearing white smocks and lets no one hold him by the hand except his mother. There he goes again. No, no, we're not going to cry. We're going to buy a favorite candies. Just three weeks ago, Danila underwent the last operation when the Ilizarov apparatus was removed from his hands. His mother has spent three months at the hospital with him, and now she's going to see to it that her son's fingers work properly. Natalia, the surgeon who operated on him, suggests some methods. You could buy him a mosaic toy so that he could put together patterns from colorful tiles. He will find it interesting, and besides, play stimulates mobility of the hands. Danila and his mother share a congenital pathology. The fingers of their hands were stuck together when they were born. Ksenia took her son to the Ilizarov Medical Center and still cannot quite believe the amazing progress. She herself had bad luck when she was a child. Her fingers were separated at an ordinary hospital and was so deformed that there is now no chance of curing the deformity for the rest of her life. Valerie Brumel. This name occupies an honorable place in the history of world sport. People often have to overcome hardship before they receive recognition, and Brummel played the role of a helping hand in Ilizarov's life. He is the 1964 Olympic high jump champion and six times world champion. 
His last record, 2.28 meters, lasted for eight years. A car crash shattered his career, but Ilazarov helped him regain the use of his legs. The athlete's gratitude prompted him to do his best to campaign on Ilazarov's behalf among the most senior Soviet officials. However, worldwide fame came to him only 10 years later. This is Stony Brook University Medical Center in New York in the USA. The Ilazarov method has been applied here for more than 10 years. This method has been responsible for the fact that today, Mardin Altenai can walk properly. After a car crash, he was faced with the prospect of amputation, but the frames saved his limbs. Without the frames, he would have lost both legs. There's no doubt about it in my mind. It was pitch dark during that summer night. The Long Island Expressway was slippery after the rain. Then came the crash and complete darkness. I don't know much. I don't remember. Newspaper reports later wrote a great deal about his amazing recovery, despite the fact that he had lost an enormous amount of blood. His left leg had been fractured in three places, and a three centimeter bone fragment from his right leg had been left at the crash site. Mardin was lucky enough to land in the hands of Nicholas Devaris, one of the best specialists in the United States using the Ilazarov method. His was a very complicated case. He was taken to the operating room 11 times. We put the Elizarov on here. We actually, through this small incision here, cut the bone where it was good. Down here, he was missing the bone, and we actually lengthened the bone down and uh, uh, got the bone to heal. It was an incredible result. The Ilazarov technique became known in the United States more than 20 years ago, but there are still few specialists using the frames, although their numbers are growing. Among them is a woman who became familiar with Ilazarov, his device and method, almost at birth. So, Mark, we wanted to introduce you to this is Svetlana Ilazarov. She's... Nice. Hi, it's nice yeah. to meet you. She's originally from Russia. Her father invented the frame that, that was put on your legs. Svetlana has lived in the United States for nearly 20 years. After a course of medicine, she followed in her father's footsteps using his method. Considering that the Soviet Union was a closed country, worldwide fame reached Ilazarov only 30 years after the invention of the apparatus. This happened thanks to Carlo Mauri, an Italian mountaineer. He had been denied medical care for an injury. At that point, a Soviet traveler and TV presenter suggested he go to Kurgan. He would like to know your decision. Can you help him? We'll try. Once again, Ilazarov stunned the medical world. Italian surgeons couldn't believe their ears when they heard the news from the Soviet Union. Later, they dubbed Ilazarov the Michelangelo of orthopedics. When the surgeon first went abroad in 1981, his course of lectures in Rome was the starting point of his technique's triumphant march around the world. The Ilazarov Center in Kurgan. With surgery drawing closer, Oksana chats with her roommate in an attempt to distract herself. She shows her pictures of her legs before surgery. Those memories will soon be a thing of the past. Now her legs are almost normal. All that is left to do is remove the frames. Here, my knees look somewhat twisted. In order to remedy the problem, both of Oksana's legs were fractured in two places, and the frames became part and parcel of her body for three long months. Well, you can live with such legs, but I think if there's a chance of making them better, it must be used, so that in old age I don't torment myself for missing the opportunity to do what needed to be done. One of Oksana's roommates, Veronica, has already had the frames removed and is about to go home. She will have to come back in a year's time to have her scars treated. But what heartens her most of all is that she will no longer hear jeers from her classmates. Now she is just as everybody else. Veronica's problem was that her left forearm used to be several centimeters shorter than the right one. The apparatus I used to wear was not a big affair. Here there were two semi-rings, and here was a ring in the middle. A little semi-ring was here. Of course, I had to put up with it, but it was worth it. They have really given us a new lease on life, because it was not only that one forearm was shorter than the other, there was also a deformed joint. It didn't allow the arm to move as freely as it should. As always, the center's therapeutic physical training gym is crowded. Everybody is supposed to come. 
Elizarov's other discovery demonstrates that, given frequent exercise, the bone grows faster and heals better. Every day, Veronica spends several hours in the gym. She has to be in good shape because she attends ballet school. She was told that if she wanted to carry on with her studies, she would have to have her short forearm lengthened. Now she will have to spend a lot of time exercising so that she can regain full use of the arm that's been operated on. The doctor has allowed me to do a full program of exercises in eight months' time, but I'll start doing simple exercises in two or three months without exerting myself too much. Stony Brook University Medical Center. Svetlana Elizarov examines biker Mark Lightcap, who's been involved in a motorcycle crash. Svetlana's job is to monitor patients after surgery. Now, um, you know, they, what they're trying to do is trying to uh, get the bones, shorten the bone up. Good. Now we're we're going to get the x-rays and then we'll maybe we'll give you okay. a different schedule. Today is the intermediate phase of treatment. Mark is in for a regular checkup. When they tried to join his bones together using another technique, he became septic, and so the doctors resorted to the Ilizarov method. This is an ideal form of treatment if there is poisoning of the patient's bone. Dr. Devaris and Svetlana scrutinize the x-ray and discuss what could be done next. They need to decide where the bone fragment should be moved. Yeah, why don't we give them a little, yeah, why don't we give them a little translation and a little compression? Just two millimeters? Of translation? And uh, two millimeters of compression? Yeah, so that, that sounds that good. All information about the patients are put into a computer. The exact nature of the deformity, how many millimeters short, and how angulated it is. The computer then gives a printout as to where to adjust the frame to get it perfect. We used a computer-controlled Lizarov device which actually can adjust the bone to get it uh, in perfect alignment. So in this case, we wanted to take this part of the bone and move it over to close this gap. What is left to do now is adjust the apparatus itself. Svetlana tightens the nuts to increase pressure on the bone where it is needed. Mark complains about a gnawing pain, which always happens when bones grow or are moved. Svetlana comforts him and says goodbye. Now it's time to attend to another patient. Night falls on the town of Kurgan. While some people head home after work, others go shopping. Oksana has spent three months at the Elizarov Center, and such nighttime outings are the best ways of distracting herself from the routine of the hospital ward. These tights are just the right kind of winter wear, nice looking and warm. Her legs have been corrected, and one of the frames will be removed during tomorrow's surgery. In anticipation, she buys clothes which she has not had the courage to wear until now. At any rate, I can afford nice tights. Even if my legs don't become all that perfect, at least they will never be as ugly as they used to be. I don't think things will get worse than they once were. Back home, young Danila sits in the kitchen eagerly waiting for the evening exercises prescribed by the doctor. Recent surgery separated his fingers, thus ending a condition he's had since birth. Ksenia makes every effort to see to it that her son's fingers become healthy as soon as possible. Come on, clench your fists. That's right. Every game the boy plays at home is meant to exercise his hands as much as possible. His mother is overjoyed as she looks at her son, recalling the amazing results achieved by the center's doctors. Now she has made up her mind. In a few months' time, Cassinia too will be wearing the frames to correct the fingers that were disfigured by doctors when she was a child. I did undergo surgery, but not at Elizarov Center. Needless to say, the result was not as good as in the case of Danila. I do wish I had known something about the center before I had surgery. This factory, attached to the Elizarov Center, makes the frames. Orders placed by the center account for a quarter of the factory's output. The rest is intended for other Russian clinics and for export. The factory makes something like 400 sets a year, but it also continually makes experimental new parts for the apparatus. 
This is what the factory's output looks like. It is a set of parts now used at the center in Kurgan. It is possible to put these parts together in such a way as to create a unique mechanism that will suit the needs of different patients. Pins are a must in every set. They vary in thickness from 1.5 to 2 millimeters and in length. Some of them are bulb-tipped pins, others are not. Supporting pads, pin strainers, supporting arms. Time was when the way these tools looked inspired Ilazarov's rivals to dub the outstanding inventor the locksmith of Kurgan. You need to cut off pins in such a way as not to make any jags. This will make for their smooth and unobstructed removal. Dr. Shved knows that only too well. He worked together with Ilazarov for more than 20 years and has used his apparatus for about 40 years. This unique footage shows Dr. Ilazarov on vacation. His efficiency and conscientiousness were legendary, and that was quite apart from his talent as a surgeon. He usually worked from 10 in the morning to 4 in the early hours of the following day. He saw the purpose of his life in his work. Can't remember the year. Maybe 1982? The bulk of the photographs of the celebrated surgeon in the Ilazarov archive show official events. Only very few show Ilazarov with his grandson. It's you. Do you recognize yourself there? Not at all. Svetlana named her son after his grandfather, Gavril. His hobby is music. It was Dr. Ilazarov's hobby too. At first, Gavril wanted to be a musician. What was it that you wanted to do? Write music for computer games. Although Gavril is very good at making music, he has decided to be a doctor, just like his grandfather. Now he's a first-year student at medical college. As for Svetlana, as a child she saw very little of her father because he worked so hard. But she recalls that once, her parents took her out to watch the moon eclipsing the sun. They took x-rays of something or other with them, and we watched that solar eclipse through them while all others there were wearing dark glasses. It was great fun, something I'll remember for a long time. It was then the first time I saw an x-ray. Dr. Ilizarov disliked cosmetic surgery. He felt such operations were not important. But people with serious afflictions waited years for a chance to get treatment from him. And true, he once made a healthy young man look taller only because the man insisted his private life would be ruined unless it was done. The man was operated on quite successfully. Thank God there were no complications. And yet the operation did not mark a turning point in his relationship with his woman. She did not particularly like him when he was a man on the short side, but the mere fact that he had become taller did not attract her either. Today, cosmetic surgery is done en masse at the center in Kurgan. The time has come for one such operation. Oksana appears to be in a good mood, although her face is a bit paler than usual. I'm feeling fine even if I'm slightly nervous. It's a normal reaction, the reaction of a healthy person. Oksana falls asleep after being administered general anesthesia. It takes no more than 10 minutes to remove the apparatus from her body. The steel structure is quickly taken apart and the pins are pulled out. General anesthesia is administered not so much because of the pain as because of the appearance of the instruments. I think anyone would be frightened if he or she saw this close to their body. The big question is why the inventors didn't make something gentler and more affectionate. Today, only one frame is being removed. This is done for purely psychological reasons. At first, people who have undergone surgery are afraid of walking because of the change in their legs. As a matter of fact, they have to learn to walk anew. They look forward to this moment to see their good-looking legs. Well, almost. A week will have to pass before she fully realizes the change in her life. What were you dreaming about? Did they take off everything? Yes, so quickly.
Farmingdale in the United States, Mardin Altenai, a man who was involved in a terrible road accident. Being a strong person, he was able to regain physical fitness in a short period of time. But he thanks others for his recovery. God, doctors, and his parents, who were always at hand during his ordeal. I wonder how I would have fared without them. His family includes ethnic Turks who arrived in the United States from Bulgaria. Hospitality and simplicity, the hallmark of the way of life in the Balkans, reign in their house. But they recall that day with tears in their eyes. We went to hospital and doctors told us that they had to cut his leg. What can you say when such a question was asked? I told them, no, we can't. Mardin's mother was always at her son's side, helping him to take his first steps. His father continually prayed for his son's health. God gives us life and doctor helps him. Only God decides everything. Their refrigerator is full of memento pictures. Here is Mardin's daughter, his brother, mother and father. There are just no photos of Mardin before and after the crash. Dr. Ilizarov died in 1992. Thousands of people came to pay their last respects to the man of genius. At the time, clinics in nearly all countries were using the apparatus that he had invented. The Ilizarov method had cured more than two million people. The 1990s were a difficult period in Russian history. When Ilizarov died, his brainchild, the medical center at Kogan, was on the verge of extinction. At state-run establishments, salaries were not paid for months in a row. The nation's best specialists went abroad. Vladimir Shevtsov, the center's new head, got down to business without delay. He was able to persuade the center's staff to stay on, even throughout the most difficult years. Now, push my finger down. That's it. Up. Good. Now, push it as much as you can. In today's prosperous Russia, the 70-year-old professor is still at the helm. Whenever surgeons use the Ilizarov apparatus and the technologies we have developed, they're getting a potential they never had before. People come here from all over the world for a course of study. Doctors working here are constantly improving the Ilizarov method by devising new applications for it. Today, this is the only place in the world where the apparatus is used to treat the spinal cord. The center's 17 labs develop medications to stimulate the growth of bone tissue. Easy, easy. Even the most unlikely patients are always welcome here. The center is constantly turning out new models of the apparatus. One of our last constructions has already been tested and is preparing for introduction. Oksana is about to leave Russia for home. The frames have been removed to reveal her now shapely legs. Now she is wearing a removable plaster cast. This is another psychological trick to prevent the patient becoming nervous about their legs during a long flight across the Atlantic. But Oksana is not nervous at all. All she wants is to get home as soon as possible. Her husband and 16-year-old son are impatiently waiting for their reunion in Toronto. I'm missing them very much. Three months is a long time. I've never been outside Canada for so long never spend so much time in hospital. I've got the feel of my legs, although it's a bit painful around the fracture sites, but the pain is kind of muted and it's quite bearable.